Hi, my name is Ernest Yolongo. I am the co-coordinator of Upstos 175 along with Professor Orlando Hernandez. I teach history in the behavioral and social sciences. Welcome, thank you for coming to our second last event of this spring, celebrating the 175th anniversary of the birth of the birth, excuse me, of Eugenio Maria de Hostos. We've done a lot of things this semester, all of which has been focused on bringing attention to the man, Hostos, and his ideas. We've had a guest lecture, Hostos and Women. We've had student dramatic readings of the works written by Hostos. We have had Wow, now I'm drawing a blank. But uh, the history. The history. Ah, we had the wonderful open forum. My apologies to Professor William Casari, along with Orlando Hernandez and Gerald Meyer, which was a great turnout, which we did record, and is available on our website, which used to be ostos.cuny.edu backslash ostos175. Now just go to the home page, and we have our own site there that you can just click on and find the videos. Today we are doing a lecture by Professor Roberto Mori, uh, Emeritus Professor from the University of Puerto Rico, speaking on Ostos and his legacy. And Professor Hernandez will give a much more detailed description and introduction. And afterwards, we will have a workshop on teaching Ostos at Ostos, along with myself, Professor Hernandez, and some other faculty that have taken the uh, resources that Professor Hernandez and I, and I have found he has translated, I put online, which students have used to write their student essays for this contest we had this semester. Faculty have used to teach in their classes. So thank you. And now I turn it over to Professor Hernandez. Gracias. Yeah, thank you. Um, so welcome to everyone and uh, good afternoon to our guests. Uh, we're happy that um, the people from the community as well as students and faculty sharing today's event. Um, I would agree, but I think uh, there are a few things that need to be said about uh, my good old friend, uh, Roberto Mori, and as, as well about his work, the work that he has done uh, as a scholar uh, in promoting Emanuele de Ostos' work. Um, I will use mostly English, but I will move back and forth between English and Spanish, and you are please welcome to interrupt at any point. When, if you don't understand any phrases, I'll be happy to explain uh, in Spanish. Uh, Dr. Mori, an Osto scholar and a friend of Osto's Community College, is our guest today. As we continue the events of the 175th anniversary of Eugenio Maria de Ostos. Today's program has two parts. As uh, uh, Ernest, Professor Yalongo just mentioned, that we're going to have a lecture first and then uh, a uh, workshop for faculty who use Osto's texts. Um, from the different disciplines. And I think we would like to welcome students if they want to stay or be part of that as well. This is, there's nothing secret about what we're doing. What we're actually doing is really discussing what to do to promote the use of uh, Ostos' work in the classroom. And uh, while that's uh, a very germane and very pertinent to faculty, I think students have uh, quite a bit to say in that uh, area as well. Um, our speaker, Professor Roberto Mori, taught political science at the University of Puerto Rico, where he was also the recipient of the Cátedra Ostos, or the Ostos Honorary Chair, a Cátedra de Honor, Ostos, and subsequently he was member of the selection committee for that program. At the University of Puerto Rico, he was also a coordinator of Caribbean exchange and popular education programs. Roberto participated in the NEH, or National Endowment for the Humanities, sponsor seminar that we held here at Ostos during the summer of 2005. Moreover, as an outgrowth of that experience, or I should say, yes, from that experience, uh, he was one of the founding members of Los Bayoanes, an Ostosian theater troupe, right? Uh, whose events I have occasionally shared as well. Uh, so there's a, I think, an interesting element that also comes, it's an outgrowth of all this scholarly uh, uh, work and which has to do the creativity and using theater as a means to reach people. Um, Roberto is certainly one who has done quite a bit in the Los Bayuanes experience. In 2003, as we were about to commemorate the centennial of Henry Maria de Agostos' death, 
a new scholarly title on Ostos' work captivated our imagination. Ostos in Sepulto, Ensayos en la Búsqueda de la Utopía Inconclusa, which can be roughly translated as Ostos Unburied, Essays in Search of the Unfinished Utopia. And the author, of course, is Roberto Mori, our friend uh, who's visiting today. The book, published in 2003 by Isla Negra, a Puerto Rican publisher, is a lucid analysis of one of Ostos' least studied contributions his conceptualization of el poder social, or social power, right? And its implications for retooling democracy as a form of grassroots and community-based empowerment. This was unexplored territory in Ostosian scholarship until Dr. Mori devoted the effort and the uh, analysis to bring it into our view uh, and uh, although it was then and remains extremely relevant, it's still s a subject that requires quite a bit of work, I suppose, and he's doing some of that. Uh, during the last few years of his life, Ostos formulated a new way of thinking, a new paradigm for democracy, which includes very contemporary concepts, such as the idea that evolved from Antonio Gramsci's thinking known as civil society. Another important component is autogestion. Hard to translate into English, self-development is not self-help. Mm -hmm. Self-help falls short, it's something beyond that. It's really initiative and developing socially as well as politically, uh, and not just self-help. Although there is a tradition of self-help in the English uh, cultural tradition, right? In English and, and North American um, <clears throat> political history. So, this autogestion or community initiated and community centered development. Also's formulation appears to have come about from two sources his keen awareness of the need for citizens to exercise their rights actively, that is, for people to be active in the use of their rights. And secondly, the failure of political parties to represent the interests of the citizens. The shortcomings of representative democracy were particularly evident at the time that the United States invaded Puerto Rico and took over the island in 1898 as a colonial possession. Not only did the United States trample on the rights of Puerto Ricans, but the island's political parties were unable and unwilling to represent those interests in the face of a new colonial regime. The paradigm that also formulated is what we now call participatory democracy. The League of Patriots, the inclusive non-partisan organization that Austos helped to found in New York City in September of that year, 1898, and soon after organized on the island, would address the socioeconomic and educational needs of citizens, and as importantly, would be driven by the citizens themselves. This is auto -hestial. The concept was so new that when Austos attempted to describe it, he poignantly used terms that were at odds with established ways of thinking. For example, he spoke of upside down politics, la política al revés, and politics without power. In other words, politics that would not seek power. That was certainly unusual. That was not, that was not you know, what people uh, were used to. And certainly, you know, I think we, we need to look at some of that in more detail. That's why I invited Roberto to, to come today, right? While Osto's attempt to establish the League of Patriots was not successful, his formulation about Poder Social has been recovered and put to good use. In his book, Professor Mori explores not only the concept of social power, but also a number of instances in which this type of strategy was successfully used to empower communities, most notably the case of Vieques. Professor Mori will speak about Osto's life and legacy, his work as a revolutionary and educator, as popular educator and community organizer of the social power. Welcome to Austin Community College again, Roberto. Well, thank you, Orlando, and please don't, don't go far. I might need you to uh, help me with uh, my English. Uh, it's a little out of shape now. <laughs> so I might need some help. 
Okay, I'm very happy to be here uh, today sharing with you some of my uh, ideas and experiences on this topic. Uh, Ostos has been my main inspiration, maybe, I don't know, could be. <laughs> so I want to share with you some of the ideas that I have uh, developed in that sense. But what you're going to hear and see is, are, is but an interpretation of Ostos, of the many that have been, have, uh, <coughs> been over the last uh, 100 years or so, and we expect more to come. So um, I'm very happy to be here. As um, I've been to Ostos Community College uh, a few times from, I think I came here in 1870 or something, or it was just, we were just starting. I was a student in New York at that time, from New York University. And um, I came back in 2003 for that uh, Oslo San Marquis conference. And then again, 2005 for the yeah, uh, AMH seminar. So I'm really happy to be here again. Well, uh, the topic I'm going to work with you here is actually to this talk is some um, Ostos Life and Legacy, which was the uh, main the topic that was given to me. And I added a um, kind of twist to it um, by asking a question of the many I'll be asking this afternoon. Is Ostos still unburied? Of course, the term unburied, as uh, Orlando said before, referred to the title of my book, uh, Ostos in Sepulto. So I'm asking, it's still, it's still unburied. Uh, ten years ago, I thought he wasn't buried. Now I, I don't know. <laughs> I hope he is still buried, but uh, I'm asking the question, of course. So um, maybe I'll start with uh, something funny. <laughs> uh, maybe you, uh, you remember <laughs> Alice in Wonderland. There was um, um, a scene in Alice in Wonderland where. Um, Someone, someone, I don't remember who was, who asked the king, where shall I begin? And the king said, begin at the beginning, said the king very gravely. And, I can, I, I can hardly see. And go, and go on till, uh, till you come to the end. So it's just simple. That's not necessary, just, just uh, one minute. Oops. No. Well, whatever. We're switch touching. <laughs> That's the other way. The other one. Yeah. Um, is that okay? That's cool. No. Everybody can see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Begin um, at the beginning. The king said very greatly, and go till you come to the end, then stop. Which is kind of natural. No? Um, Okay. I ask, the first question I'm going to ask is there, is there an end to this story? I mean the story of Ostos. Will it keep going on? Shall we be talking about Ostos all the time? When to stop? You don't understand these questions. Anyway, let's begin at the beginning. If I were Ostos, if I were Ostos, I wouldn't give a lecture today, but maybe do an exercise or workshop. That's the things he said we should do. But anyway, maybe he would tell us, don't do as I did. As I say, and uh, <laughs> I'll be very schematic. I'll kind of propose that we turn Ostos from 
being a recorder from who came before to being a contemporary of us. And maybe follow what Paulo Freire said once, if you want to follow me, you will have to reinvent me. Just don't follow me, just like um, literally, right? So um, what shall I focus on? His life, his writing, his projects. The work I did on, on Ostos and Sepulto, I propose to focus on his projects. Why? Well, his projects involve his life. He wrote about his projects. I still think that his projects are the center, the key to his uh, to his contribution, to his legacy, the things he did. So I'm going to focus on that uh, today also. I propose that there are some keys to understand Ostos. And um, the main key, what I regard to be his one main life project, Ostos main life project throughout his life, was his fight or his struggle for liberty, freedom, or transformation, social change. Freedom from what? Freedom from despotism, freedom from religion or religious fanatism or beliefs, freedom from imperialism, freedom from ignorance. And his projects, as I see it, I see three kinds of projects that he developed. One, political, which were the first ones. He had educational projects, and he had, later in his life, what I shall call civic or community projects. And this can be related somewhat to three moments or manifestations of Ostos. First, we have Ostos, the revolutionary fighter or so. We have Ostos, the educator, and we have Ostos, the leader. <coughs> How can this be related to his life? Well, Ostos, the revolutionary fighter, mainly we can relate this to his um, life in, or his times in Spain, when he was a student in Spain, and when he came to New York. He, uh, he did political work, direct political work, struggling in Spain against Spanish, Spanish despotism, and, of course, fighting for the rights of the colonies in, in Spain. He uh, fought for that, struggled for that. Then we have, um, afterward, when he left Spain, I very, I'll be very brief on this. Uh, he joined a struggle for the independence of Cuba and Puerto Rico, mainly in New York, and carried this, this struggle throughout the rest of his life, but not as, as with that, uh, kind of force as he did when he was in New York. Then uh, he also carried this uh, struggle <coughs> when he traveled throughout South America for about five or more years after that. And then um, he also had a struggle for, or he fought on proposing the Antillean Confederation and for the dream of Bolivar, of course, of a united uh, Caribbean, what, what we call today the Caribbean region, and of course what we call Latin America or uh, a united Latin America. So those were some of the political um, <coughs> projects he was fighting for. Ostos, the educator, with more, more or less, we can frame him more or less from 1879 to 1898 although he did some educational work in the Dominican Republic after that. Um, more or less, from 20 years, he devoted to direct educational work. And there are two stages in that. One of them is the educational project he carried out in the Dominican Republic for a decade, 1879 to 1888, more or less. And some of his works and his specific projects 
art were developed in the Dominican Republic, like La Primera Escuela Normal, La Escuela Nocturna para Clas Obrera, and, of course, some of his main works, Tratado de Sociología, Lecciones de Derecho Constitucional and Moral Social. Uh, it's important to say that Hostos wrote for his project. He was not a writer of his own name, say, I'll do write because I love to write. He was writing textbooks. Most of them were textbooks or, or books where he was putting his uh, thinking down so that his students could uh, use them. So uh, the other half of his educational um, project was in Chile, very, very far down in South, of South America. From 1889 to 1898, that time he interrupted because he wanted to come back uh, for some reasons I'll tell you afterwards. And he held many um, posts there as uh, at Liceo de Chillán, at uh, Liceo Miguel Luis Amunategui, also the director of the Centro de Profesores de Chile, and he did many other things. He was uh, a law professor and um, he wrote many books there too. But as you can see, because, uh, as you can see in the title, there were reformed ideas, reformed projects on education and uh, in teaching in general and in the law school. It's, it's good to know that Ostos was a law student in Madrid, Spain, but he never finished his uh, law degree. But then he became a law professor. Don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe uh, we'll find out sometime. Um, it's good to know that um, before he went to the Dominican Republic, uh, he had married and then he began having about eight or nine children and he traveled with them all, of, all around South America, with some of them at least. And, uh, okay, so the third um, stage is what I call also the civic leader, and I use the name civic here regarding civil society. It's the non-governmental uh, sphere of society, which uh, at that time was not that popular as it is today. Everybody talks about civil society, everybody talks about NGOs or non-governmental uh, organizations today, but at that time it was not that. Uh, also himself, uh, as you might recall, was um, in his role as educator, he placed all his trust in schools public school, so, so was, um, he thought that the state could have a great role in educating the people. Um, it will be, become critical of that afterwards. It, took, it has taken us about 100 years to reach the point where he reached before he, he died, about being critical uh, about schools. Then, um, his civic and community work of Postos um, from 1898 to 1900 uh, is mainly in Puerto Rico. Maybe most of you know that Postos lived, both lived most of his life outside of Puerto Rico. And um, since he was around 13, is that right? He went to, to school uh, in uh, Bilbao, in Spain, and then returned in uh, to say, so, so to say, to stay in Puerto Rico in 1898 on the eve of the American invasion there. But then he left, and uh, I'll explain that later. So uh, he founded La Liga de Patriotas in New York, came first to New York, he went, then he went to Puerto Rico. And um, in one of years, he founded the first uh, chapter of the Liga de Patriotas, which, which was a non-governmental and non-partisan group. So he was not only concerned about being non-governmental, he was also was concerned about being, about being non-partisan. He didn't like political parties. It has taken us about 100 years after that to understand what it means to stay away from political parties. <laughs> Everybody criticizes political parties today, 
but doing that in 1998 was not easy. And uh, what else he did? Well, that same year, he uh, led a nonpartisan delegation, which is another breakthrough, to Washington to meet with uh, President McKinley to kind of negotiate with him. What will we do with Puerto Rico? You just can't go there and do what, what, as you please. So as you might know, um, McKinley will be nothing about it. Yes. So that's the end of the story. That's the end of the story. And uh, he also, after that, uh, um, he developed the Instituto Municipal de Mayagüez. This is a very important experience for him because Mayagüez is, is um, hometown, the place where he was born, but he never lived there afterwards. So, so he came back, he, he went back to Mayagüez in um, 1899, I guess it was. And then he um, ended the Instituto Municipal, Instituto Municipal, which was like a local community school funded by the municipality of Mayagüez. And as he said, it was directed at the poor, at the, at the, ch at the children of the pure poor people of Mayagüez. And um, so uh, at that time, the new um, American government in Puerto Rico were busy, very busy uh, uh, building up schools and you know, having people learn English and all this stuff, and most also to the country. They said, no, no, we have to do some other kind of education. Of course, uh, he failed in that because um, uh, the, the American government in Puerto Rico prohibited the, the municipality of Mayagüez to give him money for the school, and then the school was was, uh, was eliminated, of course. And so, once again, he was very uh, disappointed, and then he decided to return to Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic, where he was invited again to retake his educational work in Santo Domingo. And um, of course, as you know, he died uh, three years after that, in 1903. And there are some photos of his uh, burial. And what happened after that? Well, some writers um, tend to refer to this period of his life, of his, not of his life, of the time after his death. Uh, one of them called him El Ilustre Desconocido. Can you help me on this? It's uh, Illustrious Unknown or Illustrious Unknown, which is a kind of contradictory thing. He was supposed to be illustrious because he was unknown. He went into oblivion. He was kind of forgotten after that. And uh, somebody else called him El Celebre Desconocido de America, Illustrious Unknown of America. And, um, and Jose Luis Gonzalez, Puerto Rican, Dominican, Mexican <laughs> writer, called him El Olvidado, the forgotten one. And um, for some time, that was the story. But then, some time later, his fame and, his fame, and fame were recovered. Those are some of the books that were, have been published about us. We could fill at, at least three or more slides, additional slides with the covers of the books about Ostos. Beginning with uh, Las Obras Completas, were published in 1930 in Cuba, Havana, Cuba, and uh, on the celebration of the 100th anniversary of his birth. And there were many books published and, um, about Ostos. So his name and fame were recovered. But, and this is one of my questions here. Has also become a legend or some sort of myth. You know, someone afterwards who everybody talks about Rostos, 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 but what is what? There's a but always. Something that has happened after that. His birthday has become a holiday in Puerto Rico. So people on that day they go shopping. <laughs> Believe me, that's what they do. And uh, 
is honored and remembered in many places. There are so many sculptures and statues in Puerto Rico, in the Dominican Republic, everywhere. Is there, is there one in your house? No, that statue in the corner is the one, one of my favorites, in the lower right. The lower right, yes. Oh, oh that's, that's the one in, uh, in, uh, in all San Juan, Buscaglia's work. And, um, that one was highly criticized by his... Uh, yeah, it's kind of infamous. And Nuera, uh, how do you call Nuera? The, Daughter-in-law, who's still alive. Uh, yes, yeah, so she's still alive. And she was so. <laughs> because uh, you can see the details there, but he's almost naked. So you can see all the side of his body. And she, uh, Maria Asuncion, she went like, oh, that is a beautiful story. Yeah. He's on our remember in many places. Around 1990, I guess it was, or 1980 something, he was, his remains were transferred to the Pantheon Nacional in Santo Domingo, which is where the heroes of the revolution of the independence of Santo Domingo, of the Dominican Republic are buried. And he's buried there, and he has become a national hero in the Dominican Republic. That's his tomb, and that's me quite a few years back beside his tomb there. And uh, the Dominican Republic are many schools that are called Eugenio Maria de Hostos. Those are just three of them, but there are many. And there's Universidad de Eugenio Maria de Hostos. If you care to check the website, it's most, mostly a technical school. I don't know a relationship between this name and the curriculum. I don't see it, really. And, uh, <laughs> There's also a municipality in Santo Domingo called Municipio Eugenio Maria de Hostos, which was, um, uh, okay, this, this, um, this small town, very small town, I, was, I visited there in uh, September of last year, and it's a very, very small place. And there I am. They have a sculpture there, at the entrance <coughs> of the town. According to the legend, and that's what I say it has become a legend, it says that Ostos went to the town, to the place where the town was built about 10 years later, and the uh, train where he was traveling, uh, there was a flood, and the, and the water covered uh, the tracks so that the train couldn't go farther until the water went down. So he stepped out of the train and he sat on the uh, Seba, I would call it the Seba, I don't know. K-Pok tree. K-Pok tree. Or whatever. It's a very, very large tree. In, and he sat there, and then the uh, people, villagers, and uh, peasants came over to talk to me because he was very famous in Santo Domingo. He was very former of education there. So they came, uh, and he sat around him, and he came, went talking. And he said, oh, you have such a beautiful place here. You should build a town here. Mm -hmm. So they did, 10 years after. And they named the town Eugenio Maria de Hostos. First, the name was La Ceiba de Hostos, and then became. So they, last year, they celebrated the 100th <coughs> anniversary of the town foundation. And um, was invited over to the top there. Nice place, very, very, very hot. <laughs> There is a group in Santo Domingo called La Liga Ostosiana. They also have a chapter in Mayagüez in Puerto Rico. They get together. They have um, chapters in the University La UAS, Universidad Autónoma de Santo Domingo. So they give lectures and talks and very much cultural work. And they also, they also um, about to inaugurate a, a, a parque, Eugenio Maria de Hostos Park. Uh, a very old part, which uh, was named after Ramfis Trujillo. Mm -hmm. Ramfis Trujillo was uh, dictator to his son, and um, so now we're changing the name to Eugenio Maria de Hostos. It's so a beautiful place, has, has a name in Negro. But that's, that's our <laughs> In Puerto Rico, 
Uh, we have many avenues, of course, in Mayagüez, in Ponce, Avenida Hostos, in San Juan, Avenida Alteria Hostos. Uh, we have many schools called Hostos in Puerto Rico, of course. And we have an airport. Mayagüez Regional Airport is called Eugenio Maria de Hostos. Maybe the important thing about that is that uh, they fly from there to Santo Domingo, their direct flight to Santo Domingo. There's a kind of link. You see, Santo Domingo and Puerto Rico are a link. And Hostos is one of the links between those two countries, between, between the two countries. And also we have the uh, Eugenio Maria de Hostos Law School in Mayagüez. Uh, OK. In Cuba, what about Cuba? Even in Cuba, uh, Cubans are very nationalistic. <laughs> uh, that's the portico to the National Library in Cuba. They have the name Hostos at the entrance with their other. Question. No questions? Question here. No se puede hacer preguntas. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe we should wait. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 1889, and at a stamp on his name. I'll just talk quickly. And this is a very, very important thing. In uh, 2001, a book was published on the 50 major thinkers of education from Confucius to do it. And Eugenio Maria de Osos was one of the few greatest thinkers, or major thinkers, in history. It's kind of honor, it's been honored, you know. And of course, we have Osos to live in college. <laughs> the name Osos has become a kind of household name in New York. Uh, so, so, that's part of the story. Right. He's a great man, a great thinker, but um, I'm asking now, um, what are all his projects? Still lost to some very, I mean, he's still, his projects are, be, are going on. What can we say about that? I took the, the idea from El Cid Campeador, maybe I've heard about the story about this medieval warrior He's in Castilla, in Spain, fighting against the Moors. And um, it's, it is said that his wife, Jimena, ordered that after his death on the Battle of Valencia. Uh, it was in the 13th century, I guess it was. And uh, he ordered that he was fitted into his armor. And, uh, put up on top of his horse. So he led a battle while, uh, <coughs> after his death, and he won the battle. He lost the war, but he won the battle. And maybe, I thought, back in 2003, in the book, that he was like a sick campeador, and, and also who still uh, wins some battles after his death. And uh, that's the idea. But is this process still going on, or is it just Honoring, remembering. That's a question I want to ask. I am ask you. Well, going beyond remembering and honoring, um, there is some research, very good research going on. And there is some publication on Ostos. Most of, most of them on his life and work. Others are reinterpreting, reinventing him. And there is some <laughs> more profound and deep research on Ostos. At the University of Puerto Rico, there have been some efforts on that. Uh, we have a very uh, important symposium on Ostos on the 150th anniversary of his birth in 1989, which may be the, one of the biggest uh, gathering of Ostos scholars in history, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, as a result of that, the Instituto de Estudios Ostosianos was created at the University of Puerto Rico, which was something good. And um, also, the new complete works were started publication uh, at that time. And this uh, 
collection has some distinctive uh, thing that they were, uh, each book was uh, published with a study, uh, an introduction by a specialist on that topic in Austria, which was uh, something very important. Uh, also, the Cathedra on the Honor of Maria de Osto, the honorary chair, was created at that time, or somewhat after. Uh, the School of Education, from time before, was named or, or dedicated to Eugenio Maria de Hostos, the UPR, the University of Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and also the Institute of Bioethics at the Medical Science Campus was devoted or named after Hostos. Mm -hmm. Following his work on ethics, also was a very important. Ethic was an important part of his of his work. Well, what has happened about this? Well, the instituto was eliminated in about three years ago. The complete works were stopped. They they remain now. They are the incomplete works of Rostos. Uh, the cathedra was eliminated to the School of Education. I'm ashamed to say this, but they had one course on Ostos. And the Instituto, the I really don't know. The, the founder died about two years ago, or one and a half years ago. I haven't followed the, what has happened after that. And um, the Department of Education in Puerto Rico one has one of the most traditional curriculum and teaching methodology, mm -hmm. something that Ostos wouldn't approve, of course. Mm -hmm. There has been much, some efforts to reform and follow Ostos. The Critical Thinking Initiative in the 1980s was uh, developed there. It made a great pass. People, teachers become interested, but it was quietly put down. Nobody had heard again about critical thinking in the Department of Education. Some other work uh, in the 1990s, uh, edu Educación Ética y Cívica for teachers, uh, the project never reached completion. I don't know, something is happening. Uh, La Organización para el Fomento del Pensamiento is a, a private group that was founded. They used to belong to that group. They organized. Uh, Still going on, the Encuentro Internacional de Educación y Pensamiento is international, it has people participating from Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Cuba, uh, Colombia, Venezuela, Aruba, the United States, and some other people who are thinking on Ostos and thinking about Ostos educational practice. Okay? That's still going on somehow. And uh, that's the Dominican Republic. At Mayagüez, the Facultad de Derecho Eugenio Mera de Hostos, well, the school never got, never got the American Bar Association accreditation, so they're like fighting it over and he's now in his facing, he's facing out, school is facing out at this very time. And um, of course the Museo y Centro de Usos Múltiples in Mayagüez, this is, was put up by the municipality of Mayagüez, to honor his name and to foster and promote uh, activities on Ostos. And they have been quite successful in doing it. They have the money for this, which is very important. And uh, they'll be hosting this May a new um, uh, conference on Ostos. And uh, so they keep working on it. This one of the people who are really working on it. And the theater group that Orlando was talking about, uh, this group used to go to schools and uh, had some uh, presentation of, on the Ostos was uh, Ostos Road Theater, and uh, so we used uh, his theater to have students come across Ostos ideas and have uh, workshops after that, and have students talk and discuss his ideas, and. Um, has been been doing. We have been doing this for ten years. I don't know if we if we could keep going. On the political side, um, there was one group in Puerto Rico called the Movimiento Independentista Nacional Ostosiano. 
So it's officially devoted to follow uh, Ostro's uh, thinking on, pol in pol on politics. And um, um, one of the newest uh, projects uh, hosted by me is Educadores Ostosianos. <coughs> it's a group trying to reach teachers on Ostos and what they call Educación Liberadora, it's a lot like uh, liberating education or something like that, kind of uh, going at Ostos' view on education. And there is a new group now called Convergencia Nacional Boricua. It's a very, very, very recent group and it's uh, devoted to Ostos' proposal on the methodology of consensus in politics having people get it together to act on an issue and the, the initiative they have now is uh, trying to get a kind of convergence from a different group for the solution of the Puerto Rican status question. They are proposing a status national assembly, not a plebiscite, first, but the first and the second national assembly, with participation of elected delegates of the civil society, not the political parties, which is kind of hostess, that's an hostess thing. And also, this group is also proposing uh, uh, education project on the status question using popular education strategies. So uh, these are some of the things that are happening. So I'm asking now, uh, do I come to the end and then stop? Is this it? Is this, it? Is this a story of Ostos? Yeah. Ah, I believe that Ostos is saying no. <laughs> I keep on going, so let's keep going with him. Uh, I'm proposing to turn him from being a 19th century thinker to a man of our times. So how would we reinvent him? I'm talking about his projects. And um, if you recall from the beginning, the um, political education and civic and community uh, education, I uh, mean, projects. Putting everything together, in kind of summary, uh, also started from a political, acting politically, having a political stance, fighting for liberty, freedom, transformation, then resorted to education in schools. So, my, my and others' interpretation is that he kind of developed in the form of doing politics a less direct political action against the state or through political parties, but by means of educated, the education of those who would do the transformation. And this is, this, this is a very important point. And matches with what Paulo Freire said over there, I want to translate it, said education doesn't change the world, says Paulo Freire. It changes the people who are going to change the world. And that's the main idea here. That's the bottom line of what Ostos what I think also was trying to propose. And also resorted to social power, which is a way of having direct civic and community action. Yeah. So the kind of some sort of thing. But anyway, and this is the end. I'm going to end right now. What would be type of projects I would suggest? What would a contemporary Osto would do. I'm not saying that Osto would do this. This is what I think Osto should have been doing if we were alive. But this is me, this is not Osto. This is what I'm proposing Osto, or those following Osto should do. We're following the three types of projects in the political. Of course, Osto's, an Osto's important project will be working for the predetermination of Puerto Rico, that's still at large. Recognition of sovereignty, free determination, that hasn't happened. And also fought for that. He went to President McKinley to say, hey, there was a free determination. That hasn't happened yet. And another project of Austria should be project of cooperation and integration or and or integration with Caribbean and Latin American, Latin America, including Latin American communities in the U.S. I recall that was the project I developed for the 2003 uh, seminar, uh, 2005 seminar with Orlando here in Los 
how should the uh, Latin American communities in the U.S. should uh, relate to Latin America in a kind of uh, um, big project of hostos. And um, the political break of hostos would, of course, would do um, working with consensus of the methodology as a means to arrive at the, at the decision not by political parties. Hostos didn't like political parties. It used harsh language against political parties and against political leaders. And um, of course, also, also um, participa participatory democracy project, especially at the local level, would be also following Hostos footsteps. And uh, Orlando explained that before. And the educational, uh, also, of course, this is very important. Civic education, citizenship skills, what we call competencias ciudadanas, learn how to become an active citizen. And that's related to autogestion, as uh, Hostos said. If you are not educated in how to do, your, uh, assume your role as a citizen, then you won't act as a citizen. And you will maybe behave, behave more like a consumer rather than a citizen. That's a kind of uh, antithesis that some uh, Latin American writer said, ciudadanos y consumidores. <laughs> That's a kind of opposed. We're more co both consumers and not citizens. OK, on the educational side, um, if we follow us, we have to ask, what's the purpose of education? It is just to transmit knowledge from one generation to another, have people know a lot, or is it to teach how to reason and construct its own knowledge? That's what I just said. Um, the quotation there I took from uh, Austin Community College main web page. <coughs> It says, it's not enough to impart knowledge, you must teach how to acquire it. It's not enough to teach constructive knowledge, you have to teach how to construct it. It's not enough to submit yourself and to submit your teaching to a method, you have to teach how to use it in a word. It's not enough to teach to know, you have to teach how to, oh my God, how to acquire knowledge, is that right? Yes. Okay. And Paulo Freire said, enseñando es transferir conocimiento. It's not tra just uh, uh, transferir knowledge, 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 transfer knowledge, knowledge transfer but also knowledge. create the possibilities of knowledge being produced. And of course, Antonio Gramsci, he quotes, that all men are intellectuals. Not all men have in society the function of intellectuals, but they are all intellectuals. So you have to make them develop their capacities to reason and to think. So Ostos maybe will tell us, tell, teach people to think, how to follow others thinking, but to think by themselves. And also a very important part of Ostos education is the role of ethics and the development of conscience. I haven't found a very nice word for conscience, it's not conscience which is a more psychological term, maybe awareness or being aware of your duty, what you should do. You should know what you should do. This is your duty. So he thought this is where civic education comes, comes in. And his word for his uh, concept of patriotism is not the typical uh, uh, definition of patriotism. It's not like being a martyr or taking arms against someone. <laughs> patriotism means that you feel something about the country you were born or, or the community you were born and you feel like doing something for it. You feel like, like, you feel like impelled or uh, driven to help your community. That's patriotism. You feel like doing the common good, not your own good. That's, that's, a, that's a very important thing and 
And this, he thought, was a very important role of education. He said, la escuela si educa debe ser para ser patriotas, in, the, in this definition of patriotism. You see? Making uh, students who came out of school should feel that they are bound to work for the common good of the country or the city or the community or the province or whatever you were working with. And um, also, we should, because of Osto's many problems with formal education, uh, nowadays we should be concerned also with informal education and think about these possibilities now. And also thinking about regular versus alternative education. Regular is curricular, following a method, following a course. Today we learn this, tomorrow we learn that, and that's what we call regular traditional education versus alternative education, which is more tuned to the needs of the people who are being educated. And that's, uh, that's something that Paulo Freire developed a lot. And in his uh, popular education or adult education, um, or community education, which is, um, is also another way that we uh, be following on Oscar's footsteps. And then on the last part of civil society and community organizing, um, Oscar was a very a defender of decentralization, working on the local level in small communities, and the construction of social power. His definition, and this is my translation, are the capabilities that by, by nature a nation, a province, or a municipality has. See that they, by nature, each group has social power. They have to develop it. They have to construct it. They have to make it grow. See? And, and do their own thing, which is the other part and uh, autogestion may be self-sustaining. Uh, the objective was to reduce the dependence on government and politicians, doing, doing the thing by themselves, and uh, not depending that government, which is something so common today. I can do this because I don't have the funds to do it. That's normal thinking today, right? If I get the funds, I'll do it. If I don't get the funds, from the federal government and the state government, I won't do it. Autogestion means I'll do it whatever happens. If I don't get the money, I'll do it myself. And that's autogestion. And because funding takes, has another part to it, which is dependence. If you depend on what, on the people who give you the money, then you are in trouble, kind of. And, uh, well, that's something. So this is from Ostos. This is from La Liga de Patriotas, Manifiesto. He said, to educate the people, his objective was to educate the people in the practice of the freedom that would help to better their lives. So that the current generation contribute their efforts in improving their habits and increasing knowledge. So that later generations, that's us, may take hold of all the resources that freedom puts in the hands of the country. I translate it, may take hold, but the original word in Spanish is apoderarse. Apoderarse, which is not empowerment. Empowerment sometimes is um, translated, uh, I mean, uh, defined as if you give the power to the people, you give them the right to decide. Also said apoderarse, which has another, you don't wait for the government to give you the power, you take it. Apoderarse is it's yours. <laughs> you know, social power is yours. You just grab it. You take hold of it because it's your power. It's not the government. The government, you give power to the government. It's not the only way around. So we go back to the basics, right? So, so you know, what's the legacy? Um, it's, Ostos was an ideologo inoffensivo. Ostos, in 1869, his diary, he called himself an ideologo inoffensivo, a harmless ideologist. Why? Because here in New York, he was working with 
uh, Cubans and Puerto Ricans were fighting for independence. And they were so concerned about who would lead the way, whose ideas would go first. <coughs> they were quarreling. Or, uh, and he was just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to them. I'm writing. I'm saying things. So nobody pays attention to me. And I am the one who's thinking here. But maybe I am a harmless thinker, because <laughs> uh, he has no practical effect on what people. I talk, people don't listen. So I am a harmless ideologist. Is that so? Is still that so? Or maybe we should recall him as a prophet. Somebody has called that also was a prophet. And uh, we said he's a premature truth. Many of the things that Osto said are happening. So this thing like participatory democracy, civic, civic society, whatever. In that same year, Osto wrote in 1969 on the 8th of November at 3 p.m. <laughs> it was very precise. He wrote, Nesto in patria sua profeta, which means and somebody be a prophet in his own country, in his own land. So he was asking, should I be that? Should I be a prophet? 1869, he asked himself. Uh, I don't think we should regard him as a prophet. There's more thing to it, more and more, more to it. I propose that we regard him more as an organic intellectual, if I might borrow Antonio Gramsci's concept of organic intellectual, which Contrary to a traditional intellectual, uh, uh, Gramsci said that the traditional intellectual is uh, those who follow mostly scientific knowledge, that kind of objective knowledge, and that um, they think to see this is truth, this is the normal thinking. And but actually, uh, <coughs> Gramsci thought that traditional intellectuals already are nothing but kind of um, representing a hegemonic culture, dominant culture in society. Organic intellectual, on the other hand, is, are those who are counter-hegemonic, counter-dominant, or more like um, those who are kind of um, uh, threatening the normal thinking in society. And um, I believe that us to, to be regarded as an organic intellectual, that what he proposed was like doing things, turning things upside down. You know, like he said about politics. What, what, what was the concept he said? Politics upside, upside down? down. The pol la politica al revés de la enseñada en el colonial. That's the, 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 the original name. Al political al revés. So we should learn that politics, we should do politics upside down. It's another way. Politics without power. Politica sin poder. You see? Well, uh, maybe regarded as utopian, he is. So we come here, this is Sostos 175. And um, so these were some of my suggestions on what we could do. What, uh, and maybe I can, uh, somehow I hope I have helped you a lot, <laughs> or someone. Uh, and you're thinking about what to do. And also, I have many specific ideas we share about what Ostos could do. And um, what Ostos, Ostos in italics means the college. Ostos with normal, regular lettering is uh, the man. What can Ostos do for Ostos and what can Ostos do for Ostos? So that's my uh, uh, email. Thank you. There was a gentleman that wanted to ask a question. Would you like yeah. to pick the floor now? Well, I was going to ask a question, but now is, I, I'd like your comment on uh, yeah, sure. sure. Because the question became a little more compounded as you went on. And thank you for that presentation. I have some problem hearing uh, on this side, so I'll. So I'll come over here. <laughs> uh, it began as a question, as a simple question. But as your presentation went on, it became compounded. 
Uh, so it's now a more complete question. And, and instead of uh, a direct answer to the question, I'm interested in your comment. Uh, when I work with students here, and I'm new, I do a project, I'm gonna have faculty them. Uh, I try to talk to them about where they're, what it means to be an Oscos. Who is Oscos? What is this place? And what is, um, what is the light that he shines for you to follow? But of course, as with everything else, students often have no idea whether they're in Oscos Community College or the other Martin Luther King Community College or wherever, they have no idea where they are. Mm -hmm. And so you have to often uh, present them with an idea with a punch. And we have a very fortunate mix here. We have heavily Dominican, heavily Puerto Rican, and other groups as well. And uh, I'm Puerto Rican origin. And I have always felt a kinship with Dominicans from, and in my family tradition, in Puerto Rico, Ponce, and San Juan. Uh, it's been very strong. So I'd like to point out to them, I, I get a kick out of pointing out to them that, do you know that Ostos is buried in the Dominican Republic? And uh, however, uh, he declared in his will, and this is one of the questions that I had, and I hope it's not a popular, because I read it decades ago and I just don't remember the source, that he stated that uh, I'm gonna stay here in the Dominican Republic until Puerto Rico becomes liberated, independent, and then I wanna be buried in Puerto Rico, which of course we know is never gonna happen. So, but, but the function to me is that uh, it's a poetic paradox that he stay buried in the Dominican Republic with that statement that if things were the way, as the idealist idea, uh, as the utopian that he was, that if things change in Puerto Rico by some miracle that I'd be buried in Puerto Rico. But, uh, but as it stands, it's just a beautiful poetic balance between these two communities that are really, I always say, 20 minutes apart. Um, so that was the, the structure of my question. So I don't know if you want to make a comment on that. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I think I'll, what I'll say is that Ustos um, needs a lot of research because there are many things that have been said and um, about Ustos and trying to interpret something he said here and there. <coughs> and um, I believe that some more research will shed some light on, the, on other uh, interpretation of, of what he was thinking. Um, especially that one that says, uh, si Puerto Rico mm -hmm. decide quedarse el yugo americano, it's harsh word, you or joke, American joke. You know. I'll, I'll stay here because um, I'll be uh, an exile as I have been for the last 30 years. Well, uh, I don't know where that words came from. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, you have not seen a document? Yeah, it's, it's in a letter or someone. Yeah. He wrote um, much of the thinking about this uh, kind of um, political things are letters he wrote. He wrote a lot of letters. And yeah. kind of, um, maybe he would be in Facebook today saying, <laughs> <laughs> well, he wrote many letters uh, to uh, his friends and, um, and, um, and some of his students, former students. So, uh, so he said that. But did he really mean saying that if he died, he would uh, prefer to be buried there. Mm -hmm. But I can say some things. Um, when he was, before he left in 1900, he went to Mayagüez Cemetery. It was a very interesting thing. And then he wrote his sister Rosita of the American Republic afterward when he was feeling sick already. And he wrote, and um, Rosita, there's a, a nice uh, spot in the Mayaguez Cemetery beneath a tree that I liked. And um, if the sea 
Si el mar no me reclama, I would translate that for me. If the ocean doesn't claim me. If the sea doesn't claim me, which maybe is poetic, I don't think that he was thinking of about being thrown at sea. <laughs> but he was, he traveled a lot. He, maybe he was writing in a poetic way, saying that uh, if I am traveling around, and if I die somewhere, if I don't die somewhere, then I would like to be buried in that beautiful spot in Maria That was a quote from the letter to his sister Rosita. And uh, that's one thing. Another thing, just before his death, he was very, very sick. There was a revolution going on, a revolution, a kind of uh, a coup d'etat, uh, a golpe de estado, yeah. going on, and um, he was uh, he was deprived of his title as the, uh, the director of education, and of course he was feeling sick and he was feeling so miserable that he said, "I want to leave the He was uh, looking for money. That was um, when Bosch wrote his biography. He was looking for money to pay for the for the for the trip for him and his family to get away from the American Republic. But things were so bad. So, and then there's that quotation that you, you said. It's, ah, if I stay here, so what's the truth? You know, I, you know, my, my own thinking on that is that. Maybe that's not as important as we think, that uh, um, Osto's main idea, I think, was that Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Latin America, for him was just one thing. And being buried in, in Santo Domingo is like being buried in Puerto Rico. And uh, being buried in the National uh, Panteón Nacional is an honor. Uh, Maybe he won't get here, <laughs> uh, or at, at that little spot in my West Cemetery. And uh, so, why should we bother about that? Uh, um, his patria, what's his patria? His, well, the Ostos family came from Spain originally. They went to Cuba, where they added the H to Ostos. And, um, that were hostos became an hostos with an H, so that you can say hostos. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's very interesting because in, in some people in, in, in the Dominican Republic call me Otos. They brought the first S, the Otos. So that's not important anyway. So, um, and then they, they, they moved to someone, his, uh, his grandfather or someone, moved to the Dominican Republic and then to Puerto Rico, and then uh, that person married uh, someone from the Dominican Republic, and then Costos was born in Maya, but he could have been born in the Dominican Republic, or in Cuba. He never visited Cuba. He, could, he never went to Cuba. Never went to Cuba. No, he couldn't. But he, um, there was many strange things. He was, um, uh, he and Jose Martí, they were, they worked for the same project of independence. They both they wrote letters to each other. They both worked in New York City, but they never met. Oh. <laughs> Very strange. Those were the days. Those were the days. You know, uh, Ostos came to New York in 1869, and then came two or three times until 1870 something, right? And then he left came back in 1898 when Marti was dead. Right. We have a question in the back. With, and then, oh, uh, yes. And actually, I'm sorry to have to put a limit on this, but after Jim and no, no, the said, thank you. Uh, yeah. we'll need to cut it off because we do have this workshop scheduled and I don't want to keep the participants too late. So, Father Sheehan, if you can go. Yeah, I, I'm, the last few semesters, I've had the students do a term paper on hostos. And the one comment that I, I find really interesting is, I thought my college, I don't know why I was here, what the